So if, <clears throat> if I had to define spatial correlation, I would go back to Legend and, and Legend, uh, the, our green Bible. Uh, and it says that it's a property of a random variable which takes values, so it's a numeric variable. And at a pair of a given site, a pair of, uh, a pair of sites uh, that are a given distance apart, they tend to be more similar or more dissimilar than expected by chance. So that's a, a precise definition. It's a little bit statistical, but we can, we can translate that to uh, our ecological meaning. So suppose there were no effect, no absolutely no relationship between sites. Over time, you would expect that each site would have its own history. And everything that is happening there is completely independent. Those are neighbors that don't talk to each other, right? So given enough time, A pair of sites will have a random relationship because each one has its own ecological trajectory. However, if they are related, you would expect that their similarity or dissimilarity is bigger than expected by chance. Right? And what does a random map look like? That's an interesting question. So if you look at the map and it's, you know, there's no spatial pattern, how does it look? It is evenly matched. Even? Including the colors. Oh, it's even. Yeah. Anyone else? seen the TV when it's not in the channel? But how do you call that? Like static. So that's a map without a pattern. You can't really look at that and imagine there's any figure there. It's just random. See, uh, a, a given point in your TV may be completely different from the point nearby or they may just happen to be the very same color. That's a random map. Those are really rare to see in nature. Really rare. So every departure from that pattern is probably in the direction of spatial autocorrelation. Which means that sites that are close by will tend to become more similar. Or, as we will, we will see, sometimes ecological processes are so interesting that they will make sites different. So they tend to have different patterns. They tend to vary uh, in space. OK, so let's imagine this is one variable. For example, to simplify our example, this is a trend set. So imagine this is a trend set. And you have measured a given information here. It could be temperature. It could be species richness. It could be anything. You have a value here. And then after a couple kilometers, you have another uh, value here and here and here. So this is in spatial data, but it's one dimensional. Now, let's do something. Let's correlate, let's make a correlation between the variable that you have just measured with the variable itself. What is the correlation with a variable with itself? It's a perfect correlation. It's the maximum possible correlation. If it was 
being measured by some correlation index, like Pearson's correlation index, which ranges between positive one to negative one, then it would be positive one. You cannot have more similarity than the variable with itself. Right? Now, why don't we do this? We're going to shift our transect. And now, we are comparing the number that you have just measured here with the neighbor. So I have shifted slide at this to this direction and this to this direction. Now I'm comparing this to this, which means this compares. What will be the correlation between this the variable now? What what would you expect? Less than one. Why? Okay. And do you think that will be close to zero? No, close to one. No, close to one. Why not zero? Why not? They are close to each other. They are close to each other. Yes. It's can it can also be close to zero, depending on what each of the data points represents. Yes. Uh -huh. If the data point represents mm -hmm. different maybe from data one to data ten. Well, let's suppose that these are the neighbors. If they are neighbors, yeah. it is close to one. But if you over push it, the other side of the are mm -hmm. Anyone else? So, the guys over here think that it's less than one, but it's still a high correlation. Mm -hmm. What if we do this? The correlation will keep on moving with an increased with a stable percentage for every gradient you move. Mm -hmm. That is expected. And then, well, comparing the scenario two with the scenario three, do you think the correlation is going up or down? It's, it's reducing. It's reducing. Yes. But it depends if the, if the samples are close to each other in a particular gradient, it will reduce a predictable pattern. A predictable pattern. Yes. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Who thinks the correlation is going up? Who thinks the correlation is going down? Who thinks you can predict how much the correlation increases? <coughs> Two? Three? Who thinks it's unpredictable? One? Two? Three? Four? And a half? <laughs> <laughs> Well, now you guys have figured out what spatial autocorrelation is. So the concept is pretty clear to you. Spatial correlation is exactly this property that makes things that are close by related. When you start comparing things that are further and further and further apart, the correlation tends to go down. The way or, or the magnitude of the reduction in spatial correlation depends on the variable you have. It may not be predictable. In rare cases, it's going to be predictable. Uh, we're going to see examples on, uh, of this happening. And, but in, in general, I would not say it's predictable. It's going to be a very rare scenario. So. From the statistical perspective, it's kind of hard to do this exercise. And the problem is that our maps are two-dimensional. So we cannot shift one cell to the neighbor only. 
because they're actually neighbors in all directions. So it's not as trivial, trivial as this one. But we can come up with, with a solution to do exact the same thing in a two-dimensional space, but it's not going to look as simple, right? But keep in mind this sim the simplified example. This is what we're going to do. In particular, keep in mind this called lag. So here, you are comparing the neighbor with the nearest neighbor. Now, here you are comparing uh, one cell with two cells apart. So, keep that in mind, and we're going to call this distance class. Right? It's going to show up later, but it's, it's very simple. It's what is the distance that you are comparing things against. Okay, spatial autocorrelation, this concept, is uh, both an analytical technique or a met met methodological thing, like you can measure, you can observe, you can uh, uh, translate, you can use, but it's also consequence of spatial processes that we have been discussing since early this morning. Uh, I could ask again, but why are things that are close by similar? Because of ecological processes that are structured in space. For example, uh, genetics. For example, history. For example, we tend to expect that close, the things that are close by have similar environment. So, uh, because of ecological processes, you can observe spatial autocorrelation. But spatial autocorrelation is also an analytical technique. It's the same name is used for the, met for the statistical method we're going to use today. In fact, uh, Pierre Lejeune tends to use the name spatial autocorrelation for what we call the endogenous or intrinsic processes. He used the, the very same name. I don't like that part, using the same name for multiple things. So do you remember that, for example, uh, we discussed that birth rate, death rate, m dispersal capacity can cause spatial pattern in a map? Okay, to Pierre Legendre, that's called the spatial autocorrelation process. So it's an ecological process, right? Uh, on the other hand, his, according to him, uh, spatial dependence is when an external factor prints its own spatial pattern in the variable that has been affected. For example, there's a map of temperature. Temperature happens everywhere. So because of temperature, the map of species richness tends to be similar to the map of temperature. So that will be dependence. Uh, that will be spatial dependence because species richness depend on temperature. Uh, but if, it, the, if the process is, is intrinsic to the species, then it will be spatial autocorrelation as a process. Um, people tend to find this a little bit confusing. And what I'm going to try to do is use only the word exogenous to separate between the processes that belong to the environment or, or to things that the species is related to. And I'm going to try to use the word endogenous to the characteristic or the features of the species affecting its own distribution in space. Okay? All right, so here it is. Looking at this map, do you think that sites or regions that are close by tend to be similar? How does it look to you? 
Does it look like static? Or do you see a pattern? Does everybody see a pattern? Do you see anywhere in the map that looks a little bit random? Or what is the most random part of the map? You can't say Mexico. It's going to offend people. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, things are pretty similar, right? Especially those that are really close. So pick a point in the map and look around. Tend to have the same color. That's called spatial autocorrelation, right? But now, let's do this. Pick a point and look a, bit, a little bit further, away from that point. Is the color changing? It is, isn't it? Now pick a random point and look even further away from that point. The color may be completely different, couldn't it? Right. So we need to measure spatial autocorrelation. That's something we need to do. But we also are interested in how spatial autocorrelation decreases with space. Wouldn't that be interesting to know? how fast it decreases. Because it could point to us, it could, it could tell us how much structure there is in the data. Or how strong these spatial processes are. Right? Okay, after we learn how to measure spatial autocorrelation, we're gonna not only have a single number to tell how structured there is in this map, but later we're going to ask how much this particular point or any point is related to its nearest neighbors. So we can actually have two types of spatial autocorrelation. One, one that describes the entire map and one that is actually a map of similarity. And that we call local spatial autocorrelation. Local spatial autocorrelation, also known as LISA, is local indication of spatial autocorrelation. And it indicates the extent of significant spatial clustering of similar values. Right? So it gives me a number per site and say how similar that particular site is to its neighbors. The opposite of that would be a global spatial autocorrelation. It just says for everything that is 100 kilometers apart, it's this much similarity. Um, okay, we, we're gonna go through spatial autocorrelation later, a local spatial autocorrelation later. And also, another concept we need to discuss is what we call spatial stationarity. Uh, most uh, techniques we're going to learn in spatial statistics, they assume spatial stationarity. And by spatial stationarity, uh, it's an assumption, it's not an evidence, or, or it may be an assumption that you may or may not violate. It says that whatever we are studying, has a common cause across space. So we are not dealing with exceptions, right? So if temperature affects species richness, temperature must affect species richness in the same way across the globe. Yes, temperature may vary. And because of that, species richness will also vary. But there may not be a place on Earth where temperature does not affect species richness, right? Or where a place on Earth where temperature is more important than others. Because that would violate or that would make a, a, a process that is non-stationary. Okay? So we're going to assume the patterns we are studying are stationary. So 
Uh, there is a statistical definition for that. It requires invariance in the relationship between response and explanatory variable, which means the cause must be constant across space. Uh, we usually use local indication indicators of spatial correlation, or LISAs, to test the assumption of stationarity. And we're going to do that by the end of the afternoon. So these two concepts is going to be a lot more crystallized. We're going to experience that uh, event or, or, or that concept uh, on the analysis. But just keep that in mind, OK? All right, here is another pattern, another map of species richness. Um, and again, anywhere we go, things that are really close tend to be really similar. When you start comparing things that are really far apart, you may get something that is similar, and sometimes things are really dissimilar. Okay? And so our goal is to measure how similar, how similarity is structured across spatial distances. All right, how do I describe spatial relationship among units? We're going to get two cells, compare them, see how different they are. And suppose we are getting only the cells that are nearby. I'm going to do that for all cells. And then I'm going to start comparing things that are a little further apart. I'm going to do that for all cells. And I'm going to come up with a an, an statistical measure that tells me how much similarity there is. And again, measuring similarity is pretty simple. We can use, for example, Pearson's correlation coefficient. Oops. Well, to describe these spatial relationships, what is neighbor and what is not, what is distant and what is not, what is far apart and what is not far apart, we're going to use something called the matrix W. The matrix W has nothing to do with the variable you are studying. It only describes the spatial relationship. Uh, when I was a kid, there was no GIS, there was no GPS, we only had to navigate when we were driving in this atlas of roads. Uh, how do you call that? Uh, road maps uh, or road atlases. And in every corner of each page, there was this 